Okay, well look, welcome everyone um, to our campfire conversation. There's been two or three of them so far and um, today um, Peter Dobbs from Christian Cabin New Zealand gets the opportunity to share with you um, just a journey that um, Christian Cabin New Zealand has been on to try and support members and um, Peter's only been in the role since February this year but he's doing a fantastic job and um, I really appreciate working with him and He's um, got a great team around him and he's really um, connected well with all our members and I'm sure that they're valuing his input into them personally but also into um, innovation for their sites. So um, Peter, you're going to introduce your family to us. Fantastic. Well, thank you, first of all, for the chance to um, come and, and have a chat to, to you guys today. It seemed a little bit ironic for me to be speaking to all of you about something around camping, given my complete lack of experience um, and a lot of your extensive experience. But let me start by uh, introducing to you my family. So I'm going to share my screen with you. Here we go. So this is my family and myself at Camp in January this year, uh, where we were doing the camp speaker role at a ministry camp, and the theme was the army, so I pulled out my uniform, and then all of my, my wife and my children all stole bits and pieces of, uh, <laughs> of, my, of my uniforms that I had lying around the place as well. Um, and so I have uh, one wife and five sons, so that's um, enough of both. And, um, and I love them very much, and we, we're very much on this journey together, and we're trying to kind of feel our way to work out what that means. Um, some days it feels like dad's not around or um, can't you know, be there when they might, might want me, but other times they get to come to camp and do fun things. So, you know, there's a bit of give and take and, and we're finding our way. Um, in terms of my background, which is relevant to this, to this talk, as I indicated there with the uniform, my, my first career was as an officer in the New Zealand Army. And um, Following that, I've been involved in private education. Uh, I ran a commercial diving school where we trained people to work on oil rigs, doing underwater welding and that sort of thing. Um, I've studied and taught theology. Um, I spent a short period of time living in Papua New Guinea with my family in a very remote area in the Gulf province um, at a missions hospital. And so I've done, I've done a lot of really interesting things. And I just finished my PhD in theology last year, but I've never been involved in camping. I've been involved in camping in a volunteer role and, um, and in a ministry context, but, but never personally working within camping until February this year when I came into this role. And, and that's all relevant um, to this because I don't have answers. <laughs> and there were lots of questions when we came into COVID and there's still, still lots of questions floating around as well. However, what I did bring is an understanding of mission um, both in terms of my, my military background, but also my doctoral research, which looked at um, how faith shapes practice and faith-based organizations, and mission drift was a really big part of that picture. Um, and I understand how to use the resources that we have at hand in order to help achieve the mission, whatever that mission might be, so to be focused. So that, that briefly sets the scene for our chat um, today, and uh, the, the title of it is, What is in your hands? thinking about resources. So I guess I've, I've kind of broken down the way we're going to tackle this into the need that I saw, um, what our response was to that need, uh, a caution that I have around that, um, and then what we actually produced in terms of the product that we provided for our camps to help support them um, to get through from a business perspective, primarily through the COVID slump. So six weeks into the job, um, COVID-19 happened. It's like trial by fire or hospital pass. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the job. And now it's all going to change. Um, no pressure, no stress. Just carry on, Peter. You'll be great. Go for it. We trust you. Like, man, I don't trust me. I don't have any answers here at all. And the camps were really struggling, as you guys know. Um, they were struggling with bookings and uncertainty. And then we went into lockdown. And they, were, they received some um, support from our government, particularly around wage support for their staff, which was a massive blessing. But uh, that was still a drop in the ocean. And, and they still, what, there's the, all the uncertainty of the future and what, how are we going to retain our staff and all these things. How do we, what is normal? How do we get back there? And we thought that we'd probably be able to operate 
in some limited capacity at a camp once the lockdown ended, but we didn't know what that looked like. So we're just thinking, what can we do? And, and our response was, um, as Christian Camping in New Zealand, our job is to support and encourage and equip um, our members, the camps. And the thought that kept coming to my mind and to a few other people as well who spoke to me was God calling Moses and saying, what is in your hand? And, and, and Moses had, he had a piece of wood and, and God was able to use that as a sign of power, which gave him authority to ultimately leave, lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And similarly, when, when Elisha was helping the indebted widow, he said to her, what do you have in your house? And she said, well, I have this little jar with a little bit of oil in it. And that oil continued to flow until the debt was paid. And so the, the challenge to me and to us, I guess, was what is in your hands and how are you going to use that? Um, the immediate need that the camps were facing was was financial. Uh, how, how will they be able to retain the staff? How, how long can they survive? Um, that was a real concern. And as I said, setting the scene, my experience, I didn't have the answers. Unlike Jenny, she's been involved in this thing forever. She would have all the answers. Um, no, but it's a unique environment. Like she would have certainly more answers than me. And she's a very creative person as well. But even, even for Jenny and for other people with experience like her, it's a unique situation. We've never been through something like this before. But what we did have was a network of really experienced and creative people. And a lot of those creative people and experienced people have ideas, but don't necessarily know how to um, implement them, particularly when they're new. And other people have fantastic implementation skills and didn't, don't necessarily have the creative concept. So what I found in my hand as I was trying to lead this response to support the camps was human resource. It was people. And, and so I got a few of them together who I thought would be particularly good at this task and who were interested and willing. And, and I, I gave them, and I also got a, um, uh, some, a friend of mine who runs uh, a part of the business school at our local university. And, and I asked her to facilitate this group. And the task I set them was to come up with five business plans that were practical and simple, easy to implement, and, and, um, and could be quickly implemented as well. So not, not a massive financial investment or anything to make it happen, and it had to be able to be responsive and happen fast. Um, and so I wanted a broad sales pitch of each of these five concepts, and then I wanted a supporting document with a step-by-step, -step. these are the things that you need to do first, second, third, this is what you need to think about, maybe this isn't a good fit for you because of these risk factors, that concrete stuff. Um, and, and the objective really behind it was to um, uh, encourage and get some creative thinking going for the camps, but also to ask them or to have them ask the question, what do they have in their hands? So I was trying to use what I found in my hands and encourage them to do the same functionally. So the caution in that, in that approach is the risk, uh, the, the need is money. Um, well, how do we keep the doors open and the lights on? And how do we not fire people? Like we, we want to keep, we, we love these people. We've invested in them. We're connected to them. They're on board with us. We don't want to go letting these people go. But that requires money. And right now we don't have any. And so there's a real risk um, around resource dependency for Christian ministry that it, it takes you away from your core mission. And let's not uh, kid ourselves. The core mission and the core function of Christian camping is and ought to be introducing people to Jesus and growing them in their relationship with him. And, and if that's not it, if something that you're doing doesn't ultimately contribute to that in some way, then it's probably not something we should be doing. And, and so what does that mean for us when we're facing r very real practical financial pressures and we're trying to answer the question, how do we get more bucks in the bank? Um, and so there is a tension. And so that's something I was very aware of and something that on the, the opening of this document, I, I have a little blurb which says some words to the effect of, remember, this isn't your core mission or it may not be your core mission. It has to be a means to an end. But that means can still be contributing to the core mission because it keeps the lights on so you can return to what you called to. Just don't get distracted. <laughs> Keep the main thing the main thing. Um, so the product, what did we actually produce? After about six weeks of work, uh, this small group produced the documents that I asked for. Um, 
and they come up with the thing that we call the business innovation pack and then the action plans for implementation. And I'm going to show you this document now and um, just walk you through it fairly briefly. There may be some benefit in the content in the document for, for, for some of you and for some of your camps, but I think probably the specifics are largely contextual. And so your context is going to be different to our context. And so I think probably there's more value in this discussion um, for, for me to encourage you, as I encourage our camps, to ask the question, what do we have in our hands um, that we can use? What's God calling us to? And let's not forget why we're here, why we exist. So I'll talk through it. I'll just I'll briefly go through the 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 um the elevator pitch, big pitch of you, and then I'll just show you an example of one of the action plans because they're they're pretty detailed and we, we don't need to go through them. So I'll just share this screen with you. Cool. So that one other point um, is we were assuming within our context that we were going to be returning to camping. So when things opened up, there would be camps happening. They would be in some limited capacity, but one of the objectives was to, um, to get new clients through the door into camps rather than just looking at other external stuff. Um, and I know for some countries that won't be a reality of what, what you're aiming for. So this is just, as I said, this is the overview of um, why we're doing it and the word of caution around the, the mission drift um, concept. So the first of the business plans that they came up with was activate your advocates. And so I'm actually just gonna read this. Every camp has their key advocates and influencers who love them and will want to support this is a simple and straightforward plan to connect with your supporters and to gain awareness of your support. So one of the key things um, for this plan was that it wasn't about asking these people for handouts. It was about saying, hey, how can we serve you? We've served you in the past and we'd love to serve you again in the future. Right now we have a need and we know that you love what we do and we really appreciate that. Here's a way that we can help each other out at the moment. So it's functionally um, fishing for camps and being proactive about it. Uh, and then there's some details, and each of each of these plans have, a, have um, the action plan overview, which is just a very consolidated version of the more comprehensive document, which I'll show you at the end. Thinking about like prioritizing who we're gonna to talk to so that we're not targeting people who are unlikely to, to give us business, we're targeting the ones who might actually have the scope. Um, thinking about who you're talking to, thinking about the scheduling so that like, or what, one of the points there is we're not trying to get people, we're in winter right now, and so we're looking forward to summer. We're very fortunate that we're not in the, in the peak of our camping um, time in, in terms of the time of year. But if we went out and tried to get a whole bunch of bookings and we got them for summer, we're probably shooting ourselves in the foot because our, our issue is not summer bookings. We're going to have summer bookings. Our issue is now bookings. So just thinking strategically about that. Um, and then follow up things as well so that you're getting repeat customers at the end there. Point five, the photos. I, I really like this idea that they came up with, that the camp experience is anticipated, it's lived, and then it's remembered. And so part, part you, you look forward to it, then you do it, and then you, look, then you think back on it and go, man, that was amazing. And that's all part of the, the service, I guess, which is offered, the product. So ensuring that your campus have good memories by sharing photos on social media goes a really long way. Then uh, the risks and some of the resources that you might want to use and then how to advertise it, keeping it personal. I thought that was a really good point. I, I really like this idea because you're using the people who already love you. So it's not, you're not cold calling anybody. There's already a, a relationship connection there. Some of, our camps, uh, some of our camps were very successful in doing this with their local schools. Schools were super nervous coming back to camp and, and we put a lot of work into, um, at a governmental level, uh, at, at getting policy in place so that we could open to schools as early as possible. Um, and that, that paid some dividends as well. Um, so the next business plan was looking at travelers and tourism. When tourism's feeling the pinch, um, they're looking increasingly at a domestic market. And um, if we can offer camps to a domestic market, which wouldn't normally look at camping, so it's normally youth and schools and that sort of thing, um, by partnering with local tourism providers, um, putting packages together, then, then that could open doors. And so 
they look both at partnering the um, facilities at a camp as a tourism activity in, in its own right. But as you can see, coming back to my initial caution about mission drift, um, this is the, it's a pretty clear example the sort of thing that you don't want to pursue long term because actually it's very difficult to have any ministry within this context. It's not this isn't about growing people closer to Jesus. This is about giving them an experience. And then the specifics of the action plan or both of these documents at the end. So I'm not going to go through it in, in detail, but you can see the um, the broad brush stroke there. Um, okay, so the the third one was a volunteer program. I pushed back on the team a little bit around this, thinking about this as a as a um, mechanism of achieving increased income. I think their idea was that they would be able to offer a, a greater scope or a greater range of activities or reduce their staffing costs um, and that would give them some margin. I don't know if it will actually do that and within New Zealand I question the legality of it so I, I added a couple of points in it uh, just to address that so that we weren't making ourselves liable potentially but um, they were creative, they came up with the idea I wasn't going to go in and veto it at the last minute so I included it here. So volunteering at camp is a great way for young people to get a taste for camping as a career and also provide some much needed support, particularly during peak time. The, the challenge in New Zealand is legally you can't use volunteers for, for business critical activities. And so I question whether this is getting a bit grey in, in that component. But as long as it fits within your law, within your context, then there may be some advantages to looking at, at volunteering as part of a bigger picture. deal. I'll just skip through this now so we can get to some conversations. Um, again, you can have access to this document. You can go through it in as much detail as you would like. Then we had um, school program. So the, the, the thought was, how, how do we get them engaged? They, uh, would they have um, educational outcomes which require them to do education outside the Classroom. Normally they do that at camp, but they're not coming to camp. So how can we still help them to um, and get some of that business? So the idea being that um, e either would get them to come to camp just for a day, so get around a whole bunch of the the regulatory issues with sleeping arrangements and that sort of thing, um, or the other option was taking a program to them. The real key thing with this program, I think, or this concept, I think, is um, if we're going to them. It requires really experienced um, facilitators. You can't just have somebody who's who can run an activity at camp and go, oh sweet, you can go and do it at school. You need to have some a, a pretty specialist skill set. So if you have the staff who can do something like that, then it's a really good option. But if you don't, then you know it's not really a goer. Um, and so that's why the second paragraph on on uh, this slide shows that like, have you got skilled staff doing unskilled tasks just to keep them busy. Here's some options of how you might use them to get a better return potentially. And then the last one is commercialization of camp resources. So this is really getting away from camping completely, but asking the question, what are the opportunities in our local in our local um, context where we may actually be able to meet some needs? The, the ideas that are there facilities nearby that, that, that need lawns done, or do you have staff who um, you can have going and doing maintenance work somewhere else and being paid for it or whatever those other ideas are and purely a stopgap measure. So it's really departing from the core business of what it means to be a camp. It, it probably suits the more entrepreneurially minded camp manager like the man who put this particular idea forward. He <laughs> very much falls into that category. And then at the very end, we had just the cutting room floor, which was just, here are some other ideas um, that we thought of in the process. We didn't think they were worth developing in detail, but um, but it's worth you know, throwing them out there so that at least if it sparks something in you, you can, you can have a look at it. And they tended to be more specific to New Zealand, uh, except for the top bit, you know, could we talk to professional athletes and sports teams or other professional groups or, or specialist skill groups? They were talking about, um, uh, there were some women's, women's craft groups locally that, and, and going into, or art, art groups as well. Um, 
going and asking them if they'd like to come along and we can put something on for you for a couple of days. And we've got these really beautiful environments where you can do stuff. So they're so thinking outside the box a little bit. The final part that I'd like to share with you is um, just an example of one of the action plans that, uh, that we put together. So just for that first one, um, the act, uh, activating your advocates, so the way we've done it is, what are you going to do first? So in the office, you need to do, and then just step by step what the tasks are. Identifying what, what the needs are, identifying key supporters, identifying your, the, oh sorry, building a support database. And you can see step by step, broken down, and then the cost, how much money it's going to take. The idea being just to make it as simple as possible for somebody who's looking at this business plan and going, oh, that's a good idea. How would I do that? Oh, here's what you need to do to do that. And this is how much time and money it's going to cost you to make that happen. And obviously it's going to change a little bit, but just as best guess from a planning perspective, um, what are you going to do with the people? What are you going to do when you follow up with them the next time you speak to them? And then if you manage to get them to come, what are you going to do during the camp and then, and then after the camp? And so we've got something like that for each of those, uh, each of those business plans that we put together. So I guess the last question then is, um, what was the results? <laughs> so we did all this work and we, and we produced this document and we got some people who, who thought, thought a little bit outside the square and, and put something together. And honestly, the uptake in New Zealand uh, wasn't great. And I th the reason for that was we came out of COVID really quickly and we're, we're functionally out of it. Obviously borders are still closed, but our domestic market has recovered very, very quickly. And so this really became irrelevant um, almost as soon as it was produced, which is good. I guess, <laughs> it's like, yeah, why did we do that work? But what was really beneficial was um, the process and the collaboration that happened and the, the connections that were made within camps and even with Christian Camp in New Zealand as well um, were really, really valuable. And, and I know that's an experience which most people have said in, in one way or another across you know, the world, this has helped to build community because we're connecting in this way and we're being more proactive about it. But I've really seen the fruit of that and, and um, working in detail with other people. It's not just a superficial thing, it's getting deeper and it's building a genuine care for each other in the process. So yeah, it was cool. It was still worthwhile doing it, even though it wasn't widely needed or used in the end. Um, but as I said, your context will be different, but the principles remain the same. So the questions really are, what are in your hands that you can use? And survival is important, but um, how do you ensure that you do not lose sight of your core mission in that process? And when you're thinking about core mission, you need to be overt and you need to um, be, be intentional and overt in your language as well. So one of the other mechanisms of mission drift is around overtly stated um, values and mission statements. So not, not in concept, don't say we're going to promote traditional values. You say we promote the, the gospel of Jesus Christ or something like that. You know, there's no wriggle room there. It's stated. Um, and then I guess um, this meeting and the stuff in it may be of some resource to some of you. It might spark some ideas or encourage you. But really, like I said at the beginning, I don't have the answers, but you guys are super experienced and have been around this game way longer than I have. So I'm confident that um, if there's opportunities that in this room, there's also you know, the, the, the imagination and the creative ideas and the, the experience to implement some of those ideas as well. So I'd, I'd love to hear some of your thoughts and comments. Jenny. Thank you, Peter. Um, I think that you, know, you guys moved into this really quickly and the team that you pulled together, um, there's been incredible benefits for those guys working as a team and then coming back to you. So even though a lot of the sites might not have needed to have done this, it definitely has built community, like you said, and I think that's really important. So we're open to questions and discussion now. And so um, is there anything, Graham, that you would like to share from your perspective or your thoughts or anything you'd like to discuss? Thanks, Jen. Oh, yeah, look, I um, compliments to Peter and the team for for putting that together. I think it's a certainly a valuable resource. If, from, as you say, for nothing, I think the fact that you came out of it, yeah, well done. Um, not that I think 
Christian Capping in New Zealand had a lot to do with the economy coming out of it quickly. But I think the process, some of the process and some of the thinking that is used can be used anyway. The fact that it was driven by a pandemic doesn't diminish its value long term as well. The, the challenge of thinking more broadly than what we have um, gives us enormous, enormous opportunities. Um, I'll be interested, I guess, Peter, is why you thought the take was, do you think there was energy in terms of taking it up if you'd stayed, you know, in lockdown for longer or do you, you know, if the situation was different, would it have been a different response or did they just not see it as relevant to their business because they wanted to continue doing what they did the way they've always done? Yeah, I guess there's a few questions. One is um, communication is always a challenge. So like how many of them actually open the emails and respond to these yeah. things? And it's a bit of a guessing game. Um, the Another is um, some will never take it up anyway because that's just not what they do. We're a camp. What do you mean we're going to look at other yeah. options or other, other opportunities? And, but I think some would. I think some would, would kind of recreate themselves and and you know look, look at other other opportunities and engage in them. Um, the reality was the the better return on investment in terms of their time and energy was in working with schools to and and, and actually ours as well and just reassuring them that that um, we're ready for them and that we're compliant and that we're safe. <laughs> that that was a, a better better input of energy and and things are well, not quite back to normal but they're pretty close for, for most camps. Yeah, what we're seeing in, in Australia in terms of, we're two separate countries at the moment in terms of emerging out of COVID and Marcel, who's my chair and also manages probably our larger site in Australia, um, is in the middle of our second wave, if you like. Um, and the warmer you go, the further north we go, the better that yeah, these guys are um, as well. But, but the most successful sites in re-engaging even though they couldn't have groups, they were on the phone or visiting their key clients the whole time. And it was all about staying in contact as well. And you, even if you're in lockdown, you can still call as well and just keeping the relationship and showing that it is a relationship uh, and a partnership rather than just a business transaction where you're not interested in continuing the communication as well. Um, and we are still hamstrung by government regulations in terms of what we can and cannot do and our in much of this country, as I imagine Jono is. Marcel, have you got anything that you'd like to share from your perspective? Because you're going through a pretty rough time of being okay and then it all falling apart again. Yeah, that's pretty close to accurate. Um, the, um, I, think, I think that the, uh, the work that CBA did here um, was enabling for campsites and and probably our regions to 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 I guess continue or, or, or gardener the information, the relevant information. There's so many different. Um, well, everything was changing so quickly. There's so much information flowing. Um, what I um, what I appreciate about the the retooling or, or using what's in your hand. I, I really love that. Um, because I saw that happen here in Victoria and it's still going on where some, um, uh, some organisations pivoted to be a food venue or to um, support community in other ways. Um, I, I didn't see anyone take up the mowing option, but that's, that's pretty clever. And, um, and so that's been, that's been important. And, and some things, Sometimes I think I saw that happen for income generation, but other times it was for ministry generation, which I really love. You know, one of the things that we've been really blessed to be able to do is cook for our community. And so the local um, community hub has been uh, the recipient of a lot of donated food, but they didn't have a commercial kitchen to cook it um, or cooks to do that. And that's what we had. And so we're able to join forces together to provide food to the needy community um, nearby. And, and that still goes on. And we've, we've done tens of, many tens of thousands of meals for the local community in that regard. And I think that's part of what we need to do is we need to allow the blessing to flow through us because we are blessed. We are 
we, we have this confidence in, in, in Christ and um, we know that he will look after us. Let us be a vehicle to look after those in need around us. And so um, it's just been a beautiful thing. Um, I, uh, I know that, um, Jenny, as you referred to, we were, we were doing quite well as a, as a country and even as a, a state of Victoria until things did fall apart. Um, but the, the ability, and, and uh, Peter, you touched on this before, um, to equip our schools and our groups and our, um, our partners with a confidence in us but also um, and continuing communication as Graham was mentioning also allowing allowing our groups to know that we were doing everything we could to ensure that their time here was going to be uh, as safe as it could but also as beneficial as it could be um, to meet their objectives or what they were hoping to achieve unfortunately um, we're not able to do that physically on site, but I wonder if there's opportunities that we have, the staff in the hand, um, to still be able to provide uh, um, some service to our customers mm. and the people that would have been a beneficiaries from our service. You know, what, in what ways could we still give um, those who rely on us for, the, for that, um, ministry opportunities and my, for moments that change lives. So I don't have those answers, but I, I guess I wonder if there's a space there. Thank you. And I guess with the prolonged time, I mean, we, we were in it and just, just we, were, we were still enjoying our lockdown by the time it closed. So we weren't going, oh, come on, let's get back to work. It's like, this is awesome. We're hanging out with our families. It's brilliant. Um, but, you know, that only lasts for so long. And, and so uh, one, I think probably if it had continued, one of the other things I'd be, I'd be looking at is how do we grow and develop the young leaders, which in, in a ministry camp context, for, for many of our camps, the way they operate anyway, they have certain ratios that they need to, need to meet um, with, young, with youth leaders. And um, that's often a barrier to getting more young people into ministry camps because there's not enough quality youth leaders around. Maybe this is an opportunity to engage them and, and upskill them. Another example, Marcel, of um, the cooking for, for the local community, one of our camps is in a, in a, in a very small community, but the, that community is quite isolated and rural. And so they, they use their commercial um, grocery contract, uh, the, the provider, and they, rather than having the small community, having to try to trip, for, and they're quite aged as well, quite an old community, having to travel long distances to go and buy groceries, they became a, a small grocery hub for, you know, they had to go through the legalities, no perishable items, all that sort of thing, but they were able to serve the community that way. That's fantastic. I mean, yeah, cool. there's so many, there's so many opportunities with that, is it? How can we be a resource to our community for the provision of utilities and, um, as you say, groceries, or what, what else is there that we could be partnering locally in that regard? Yeah. I was in a conversation with John Ashman from the state, so he's pretty high up and looking after the homeless, and he's been in camping for years, and he was saying that um, he had been approached and also approached several campsites to actually take the homeless in, and um, they went through the pros and cons of that being quite a risk and concerned about their facilities, but the benefits have been amazing and really bringing people on a journey towards faith. And he says, you know, it's not for everyone, but for some of those smaller sites, it was just an opportunity that they would never would have considered previous to COVID. And um, that was really exciting to hear that people were being innovative. And another site in the States um, was taking on young people and had decided they'd retrain them with some skills and had sourced people all around their community, you know, to teach them to drive or to do some mechanics or some painting. And um, that was their way of, you know, contributing to the community and partnering. So, um, yeah, that was really cool. Most yeah. camps would be keen to teach young people to paint something around their camp, I'm sure. Of course they would. 
<laughs> what about for you, Jono? South Africa is, is, is a mess um, when it comes to COVID at the moment. Uh, there's no nice way of saying it. Um, there's there's a Zulu saying which which translated um, is uh, the the baby that cries the loudest gets fed first, and it's very much applicable. Um, the, the the COVID regulations just from being a hard, very hard lockdown uh, when they tried to ease them more. It just started becoming uh, the government pandering to whoever put the most pressure on them, whichever sectors and so forth. And unfortunately, the, the camping industry is does not cry very loudly and not have people in the right places to cry in the right ears. Um, so we've very much have got left behind when it comes to reopening of, of, of anything. So we still have the hardest uh, of all the, the the lockdowns at the moment, um, and uh, it's only just been slightly eased in that we can actually have people on site um, with a with a lot of restrictions. I think as an association, uh, some, and someone mentioned it earlier. I think it was Graham. Um, one of the biggest things we've realised is just picking up the phone. Uh, emails don't work anymore. You have such a low um, strike rate. And you've got, you know, you, you've got people who are the office manager opening the email and, and not telling the, the center manager, uh, not getting to the right person. And you, you spend a lot of time on, a, on a, a helpful document and it never gets to the right person or not never, but it's, it's got a low probability. Um, but just picking up the phone and really being very, very um, intentional about that and calling the right people and just having very, very long conversations, just letting them talk, uh, talking through them, they ask questions that come through, you know, stuff, some of the stuff you can answer, some of the stuff you say, <laughs> I've got no answers, but let's pray about it on the telephone. Um, it's been been very, very, very um, uh, I think probably the most impactful thing that we can do. And then been keeping keeping that going as well, you know, not one just one phone call and then you're done with that campsite. It's something you've got to intentionally keep doing um, for, for sites. Uh, I think that's, that's a big, big thing. Um, for, for my center, it's, it's been very interesting. We employed some folk from the hotel industry, um, on, on my management team, uh, who are very bottom line folk, Christian folk, but they were very much from the secular side. Um, and so I've been, you know, I've been all about, oh, let's keep the mission going. What can we do more? What, what, what can we do more? And they've been very, don't, don't spend any money. Um, and I think from, from our lots of butting heads, we've, we've, we've come to a point where um, ministry is not just about now. And I think you've also got to be very careful, um, particularly in places like South Africa and in Africa and some of the third world countries where money is so, so, so tight, there's no government support. Um, you've got to watch every cent that you've got to realize that ministry is not just about now. And sometimes you can't do anything now, but you can put a whole lot of things in place that when folks start coming back to your site, when you're actually able to go out to folks that, that you know exactly where you're going. So I think, um, just being pre very prepared for when we can actually operate or start to operate is, is really important and looking things looking at things in a long term as opposed to oh we need to help people right now obviously you do what you can right now but sometimes you just can't um but but what are you going to do when you actually can and i think being prepared and ready for that so you don't get left behind in your ministry or or, or, or your ability. Uh, I think that's been very important for us. Uh, we sort of settled on that together. Um, it sat satisfied me in that we've got a plan um, to do more ministry. Uh, and it satisfied, I guess, my, our more secular bottom line uh, management in that we're not spending huge amounts of money trying to do that right now. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Tano. And Maurice, you're going to share with us. Yeah, um, uh, like Jonas says, I, I, I know that it's very hard uh, here in Kenya um, and uh, East African region. 
um, a lot of businesses ha have shut down and uh, that applies to to anybody that's running running camps um, our staff staff various camps ha have been sent sent home and uh, uh, things aren't working actually and uh, I know on my side on my part um, uh, working with students because um, I, I work at uh, Day State University uh, where, where we, we have a campsite and uh, um, we, we, we train students um, in leadership through, through camping. And uh, uh, one of the things that we have, where we have come up with is uh, contributing as little money as we, as, as we can to, to help um, a children's home that's uh, right outside our main campus. And uh, uh, to just help them ha have some food. And uh, uh, that's working out very well. I think well, we, we don't have any way that the government is uh, uh, sending support uh, to any, any camp. Uh, um, very, very few people are getting government support. Uh, like Jonah says, um, governments have uh, very little money and uh, that's not helping the camping in the camping fraternity. Um, um, I, I think uh, uh, Peter's sharing is uh, critical at a time like this. Um, uh, well, what's in your hand? Uh, just thinking, how can we actually help uh, uh, people, people around, especially in camping? It's, it's very difficult. Um, I know at my church, uh, people are donating food, people are donating money uh, to help uh, uh, the, the not so well uh, groups of people around, around the church. Uh, there's no meeting. So uh, camps, and, I'm, and I believe what some camps are doing right now is uh, maybe trying to use the time for maintenance where they can do maintenance. But a lot of camps are suffering because um, there are no funds. Uh, nobody's coming, so there's no business. Yeah, that's the situation here in Kenya. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, Roque, what about for you? Okay, so we've got about seven minutes to go. Is there anything that anyone would particularly like to share that you've thought of um, while we've been chatting? Um, Jenny, may I just add also, uh, we've also had a few sites closed down for various reasons. Um, and as 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 Christians, um, you know, they they've shut down their membership. Uh, they said we can't be members anymore. They've they've gone through as as individual people a very very rough time. And so, you know, giving them free membership as individuals to keep them in the Christian camping community, and then um, really spending time with them, it's it's hectic for people. Um, so I think. Uh, to understand what your people are going through in the Christian world, even when they're effectively not there anymore, they're trying to find jobs in, in other places, but they still love camping and they still wanted to be a part of camping. Um, there's a very spiritual uh, support uh, that is very, very important to keep going with folk like that. Um, you don't want them hating Christian camping um, because the board kicked them and or close their, their camp down when they maybe shouldn't have. Um, so to keep in touch with folk who, who you know, that happens to, uh, I think is very important. I think um, what most of you have shared is correct, is that it's a, people in camping, they, I think in this situation, they starve relationship. Like you have people all the time coming and going, and then when that has to stop, it's like there's this huge big gap in your life. And I think that's why those phone calls, as you said, John Owen, Graham, you know, keeping communication going with people is just so important because they can't survive without it. Um, and so I think, you know, just those practical ways. And Peter said emails are not working. Well, I think camps are overwhelmed and they just don't know how to reply. So that phone call is really important. Um, Peter, would you like to pray for everyone and then I'll just close out. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Lord God, I thank you um, for the privilege that it is 
to be called to um, this ministry, which is which is your ministry. And um, things are tough at the moment, and and I'm very aware that I'm sitting in a country which is relatively speaking um, very well positioned right now. And I'm also aware that the majority of people listening to this um, aren't in in such a privileged position. And so, Lord, I, I ask for your favor, for your blessing and for your mercy on each mm-hmm. person here, and each person who's going to be listening to this, and each person who's involved within Christian Camping International. I pray, Lord, that they would feel your nearness um, and that you would be, that you would guide them and be present for them. And that they would also feel the nearness of this community as well, the support and the love that we have for each other, the encouragement that we have for each other. We know, Lord, that your weakness, uh, sorry, your strength is made perfect in our weakness. Um, mm-hmm. and, and we're weak at the moment. We don't know what to do often. And, and when we do have ideas, they're not always going to be successful. And it's just, it's just a little bit hard. So we ask, Lord, for your mercy. We ask for um, the camps that are represented here as well, that, that you would hold them and care for them and that they would feel purposeful in the midst of their anguish and, and frustration as well, that they would see the, the possibilities, um, that you'd give them creative minds and that they would have the skill sets and the experience needed to implement them as well. For your glory, we pray for in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And just uh, as I was listening to everybody today, I guess the points that really hit home to me were um, about relationships, communication, yeah. about partners, you know, and partnerships with other organisations, particularly being in partnership with your uh, schools, you know, as your guests, and you know, the communication. That's um, something that Marcel talked about. Um, open conversation. Just keep talking to people. And um, for those that have had to close their sites and then for those that are looking for employment. And um, yeah, just to keep that before us really, that we're in this together. Even though we're in different parts of the world, we still feel for everyone going through this at the moment and how challenging it is. And um, yeah, let's continue just to pray for them.